Good evening. Uh, my name's John Rees from the Don't Extradite Assange campaign here in London. Welcome to this special broadcast uh, to mark the 10th anniversary of the release of the Cablegate uh, logs from uh, WikiLeaks. Now, um, we've got tonight a, a very distinguished panel of diplomats who are going to discuss the implications of that, uh, of that leak and uh, to discuss um, the Julian Assange uh, case as it stands uh, today. They are uh, Artem Bernowski, who was a, a diplomat for her country, Australia, in Tokyo, Manila, Amman, and is Back to the time of the uh, invasion of Iraq, and he was a, a notable and extremely effective campaigner against that conflict. So, welcome to you all. We'll be coming to you shortly, but before we do, because the Cablegate release was one of the most complex releases and involved multiple facets of politics, economics, and diplomacy worldwide, we prepared a short explainer film so that you can get your heads around what happened at that time and our panel will comment on it once it's over. So uh, just um, bear with us for uh, five or six minutes while you have a look at this to refresh your memory about the cable game. Well, that's the scale of it. There are stories from every country involved that will embarrass, intrigue, and potentially complicate international relations. Or is it? that'll embarrass the United States more than anyone else. Hey, you want to hear a good joke? Nobody speak, nobody get choked. That's, that's, that's the scale of it. First up, the revelation that Washington is spying on the Secretary General of the United Nations, Ban Ki-moon. Cable showed Saudi King Abdullah repeatedly urging the US to attack Iran. Washington is sp sp spying on the United Nations. Among the biggest revelations is how the US uses its embassies around the world. Cables also cables, 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 ID cables to buy. Also cables obtain information from the foreign dignitaries they meet, including frequent flyer numbers credit card details, and even DNA material. Cablegate is a tranche of US diplomatic cables. So it's essentially all the correspondence that goes between the State Department and their embassies all over the world, which essentially detail all of the ongoings that the US has in every country where it has an embassy. Cablegate ended the Iraq war. How did that happen? One of the most important revelations that came out of Cablegate was one cable that ba basically led to the Obama administration taking the decision to end the military occupation in Iraq. The cable was written to the United States government by Philip Olster. It described how a group of multinational troops that is the US and its allies went into a farmer's house where he and his wife and his extended family, that was five women and five children, were handcuffed and then executed, a bullet to the head to each one of them. And then the soldiers ordered an air raid to the house to bomb it, to make sure that there was no evidence. The United States forces were trying to negotiate immunity, continued immunity for their presence in Iraq. Uh, the Malaki government said, no, you, if US forces stay uh, beyond uh, 2011, there will be no more immunity. And uh, Prime Minister Malaki specifically cited that document as a reason uh, why immunity could not be extended because we could not have uh, further incidences like that. Will you make sure the agreement states explicitly that there will be no immunity? Absolutely. Them? There would be no immunity whatsoever for private contractors because of what we've gone through with them in the past and because of the sensitivities to the Iraqi people. 
the Iraqi people have the chance to forge their own future. And now the rest of our troops will be home for the holidays. But Iraq's prime minister says the decision to withdraw U.S. forces is more of a legal decision than a military one. <laughs> he says the decision was made only after Baghdad refused to grant American forces immunity from prosecution or lawsuits. He says once that demand wasn't met, any talk of keeping troops there to train Iraqi forces ended. Uh, as the publication of Cablegate uh, developed and unraveled, we discovered that actually it was a collection of all the subversion of what the U.S. was doing in foreign countries. Latest leaks include American diplomats talking about Canada's so-called inferiority complex. A detailed illegal action. With WikiLeaks revealing a directive from Clinton for U.S. diplomats at the United Nations to spy on their counterparts. There's more fallout tonight from those thousands of pages. They knew that various individuals had been illegally tortured. Khaled al-Masri is an innocent man who was snatched off the street, brutally tortured, chained to an airplane, flown to a foreign land, and left in a foul dungeon. It turned out to be a case of mistaken identity. They had the wrong person. WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange says he's aiming for full disclosure on every major issue in the world. And America's top military man called on Sunday for WikiLeaks to stop publishing. One of the outcomes was that the US government, the Pentagon, set up a task force dedicated, it was 120 strong I think, dedicated purely at seeing how you could actually, how they could take down WikiLeaks. And interestingly, that task force was also the task force that came up with the assertion that was used in the, in the Chelsea Manning court-martial that no harm had come as a result of WikiLeaks publications and Brigadier General Robert Carr had had to actually testify that under oath that no harm had come as a result of the WikiLeaks publications. The third point I just want to make about where we are today, we're in the middle of a syndrome that one senior government official I really respect holds all the clearances, does the audits, pushes back against excessive secrecy, called it Wikimania. We're in the, mil the middle of Wikimania, and it's going to lead to so much more heat than light. Targeted assassination is only the most extreme case, but look at all the other proposals we've got on the table on the front burners to try to push back punish WikiLeaks, to push back against speech. The Wikimania is really coming from a series of what in my statement I call Wiki myths. There has not been a documents dump. Everybody uses that phrase. There hasn't been one. The 2,000, less than 2,000 cables are on the public record today out of that big database. And the editors of Le Monde and The Guardian and New York Times say that WikiLeaks is consulting with them about what to publish, what to redact, and doing the dialogue with government officials in a pretty extraordinary, responsible way. When Julian first was dealing with The Guardian, before the publication of Cablegate, The Guardian's investigations editor, David Lee, was given a password to an encrypted file on the internet so that he was able to access the cables. Julian gave him a password and said, and between this word and that word, remember the word history and put that in there. So the reason he did that was so that if David Lee lost the password or it fell into somebody else's hand, somebody else's hands, there's still one piece of information needed. So it was safe. It was a military-grade encryption. In February of 2011, David Lee and another Guardian journalist wrote a book about WikiLeaks. And in that, they wrote down the password. People re realized that they were able to put the password together with the file and decrypt the entire cache. Now, Cryptome was one of these people and they published the entire documents on, the, on their website. Uh, it is a US publication and the United States government has gone after WikiLeaks and Julian, Julian, an Australian publisher working out of the United Kingdom in Europe at the time. And all he did was republish some documents, whereas Crypto, laughably, is an American publication that published these documents first 
and was never gone after. Despite what is claimed, information so far released, though classified, has caused no known harm to any individual, but it has caused plenty of embarrassment to our government. They showed us what the most powerful institutions in the world are doing in our name. They showed us mass murders, they showed us corruption, they showed us torture, and they changed the world. Because we should be receiving more and more and more of these, because every time we get a, a, a release like this, we become a better society. Everyone always seems to forget that the government works for you. You get the government in, and they are your employees. But how does that work if you don't know how government works? And so the cables were this extraordinary library that would inform the nation or inspire the nation and, and empower the nation. Knowledge is power, and it would give them the knowledge that allowed them to go out and make the choice that was the most informed choice for them. Questions to consider. Do the American people deserve to know the truth regarding the ongoing war in Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Yemen? Number two, could a larger question be, how can an army private gain access to so much secret information? Number three, why is the hostility mostly directed at Assange, the publisher, and not our government's failure to protect classified information? Number four, are we getting our money's worth from the $80 billion per year we spend on intelligence gathering? Number five, which has resulted in the greatest number of deaths, lying us into war or WikiLeaks revelations or the release of the Pentagon Papers? If Assange can be convicted of a crime for publishing information that he did not steal, what does this say about the future of the First Amendment and the independence of the Internet? Number seven, could it be that the real reason for the near universal attacks on WikiLeaks is more about secretly maintaining a seriously flawed foreign policy of empire than it is about national security? Number eight, is there not a huge difference between releasing secret information to help the enemy in the time of declared war which is treason, and the releasing of information to expose our government lies that promote secret wars, death, and corruption. Number nine, was it not once considered patriotic to stand up to our government when it's wrong? Thomas Jefferson. John Reese, I'm standing in for Kristen Harvardson as chair of this discussion. And uh, I guess there's two points that should be made. The issues there are central uh, to the current trial of uh, Julian Assange, the hearings over his extradition to the United States, the release of the cables and uh, the damage or otherwise that they're supposed to have done are central to the United States case for extra, uh, extradition. And secondly, um, however important the cable gate releases were at the time, the issue is still current. Those of you looking at The Guardian in the United Kingdom this week will have seen that uh, British troops have been secretly deployed to protect Saudi Arabian oil fields without uh, the issue ever being discussed in Parliament or indeed known to the public. So we are in um, a deeply controversial and uh, currently um, active uh, political territory here. So now I'm going to move to my uh, distinguished guests for some comment on the issue. Uh, to begin with, let me bring in uh, Alison Bernowski, who is a diplomat for her country in Tokyo, Manila and Amman, and who has got up extraordinarily early in the morning in Australia to join us. So Alison, thank you very much. And uh, your initial views on the, the whole Cablegate controversy. Thank you, John. Can I just say that uh, D, uh, the don't extradite Assange, the campaign, deserves congratulations for its efforts. And I'm so glad that you're doing this. We have similar things in Australia, perhaps not as extensive, but there are populist 
people-based uh, groups meeting all the time and talking to each other all the time about uh, Julian and the problem with uh, his uh, extradition to the US. But unfortunately, that public concern is not matched at all uh, in our pol political life. Uh, the two major parties in Australia take as little notice of Julian as they can possibly get away with. And the only uh, outstanding movement that we have got is from the Greens. Uh, and that, in a sense, is political suicide because the others won't touch anything that is a Greens issue. And this is happening right now. So um, it's very important for the kind of pressure that you can build up with your movement for us to get something done, because this is, let's face it, not um, a, 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 a security or defence issue at all. It's a political issue. Governments want to show people like Julian what will happen to them if they do the sort of things that he has done. And if this continues, and it is continuing, we will see a lot more of this sort of uh, imprisonment and litigation going on over years and years and years that really uh, dehumanizes and undermines the people involved and serves as the governments want it to do as an example to anybody else who might have ideas about doing the same thing. And we in Australia are very fearful of what may happen to Julian as a result of his incarceration and interrogation and his current state of health. It isn't in the least promising. And I have to say that, you know, looking at what happened to Mr. Epstein, I really worry that Julian is not safe either in Britain or if he's extradited in the United States. Awesome, thank you very much. Craig, uh, Craig Murray, let me come to you. I mean, uh, you've had direct experience of um, being in the diplomatic corps and of um, uh, wanting to say things, and indeed, in the end, saying things that um, were um, hidden from public view. So uh, your view on this, um, must be coloured by that experience. Um, I think that's true. I mean, the diplomatic cables and the idea of, of cable gates and what, what is a diplomatic cable, of course, seems rather exotic to many people. But those of us who have been um, professional diplomats, these are our, our basic working tools. You know, the, this is the basic form of reporting that you do every day. Um, in, we call them telegrams in the British diplomatic service. The Americans call them cables. And that's simply, you know, the difference in uses of English in, in those two words in, in normal sense as well, not only in diplomatic practice. But many of these um, cables read very much as, um, as things I could have written in my uh, diplomatic career. And the... Um, uh, and the, of course, they weren't very highly classified because this was from a stash of um, low classified material, all of which is below secret. Um, so none of this was intelligence material. This is standard diplomatic uh, reporting, much of which is, is regarded as low sensitivity. And of course, when you see the things it revealed, it, it makes you wonder of course, about the content of the high sensitivity stuff, because some of this is really quite startling. Um, and uh, much of it as well, of course, um, is very revealing to people on that question of what is kept confidential, because you realize that a huge amount of uh, keeping things confidential is to protect the political interests of people and not genuinely for the public good. So, for example, the um, WikiLeaks cable gate revealed that the president of Yemen uh, had permitted Americans to bomb his own people and permitted American bombers to bomb his own people, which he had denied. Um, and that's the kind of thing which obviously the public have a right to know. 
if the president of your own country is permitting bombing of your country, that ought not to be able to be done in uh, in, in secret. And, and of course, an awful lot more um, is stuff where the Americans are reporting, um, not as a shared secret, but but the Americans are reporting uh, because they don't want um, the people reporting on to know that they know, and a great deal of the material on corruption falls into into that category. Um, but we, you know, we there was so much in these cables that helped prove things that people already know, but were difficult beforehand to prove, um, and there are really uh, literally thousands of examples you could give. My favorite example um, goes to the Chagos Islands, uh, which the, the British government refuses to decolonize, refuses to allow the, the disgracefully deported population of the Chagos Islands back to the Chagos Islands. Um, and there was something which I knew about inside the Foreign Office, which was this plan uh, to declare a uh, a maritime exclusion zone around the Chagos Islands, and to pretend this was an environmental thing was in fact uh, the motive was to make it impossible for the Chagos Islands to return, islanders to return, because they wouldn't be allowed to fish, because fishing would be banned and they are a fishing community. Um, and we had a cable in which uh, a British diplomat was telling an American diplomat Reporting it back, and the dignity exactly of that. the Chagos Islanders that the, were displayed um, here. The, the goos, by elderly ladies uh, having to the, stand that on the, the environmental street protection and shout for their basic uh, zone human rights, was a ploy, and that it was being cynically put into place um, by David Miliband as Foreign Secretary, on the basis, as the telegram said, as the cable said, that the environmental lobby is much stronger than the Chagos Island lobby. Uh, and but those insights into the kind of, of cynicism and corruption that goes on within government, I think, are vital. And that's one um, that's one revelation we got of the the bad behaviour of the British government. And governments all around the world got that kind of revelation about the ill behaviour. People all around the world got that kind of revelation about the ill behaviour of their own governments. Uh, so this was a vital public resource and a tremendous vindication of, of WikiLeaks' advocacy of openness. Thanks, Greg. Um, Hans, um, you're a former United Nations Assistant General Secretary. One of the bombshell revelations in Cablegate was um, that the Americans were instructing their diplomats to spy on um, other delegates to the United Nations. Nations that that in itself would have made a, a a news story that would have run for months under normal circumstances. Hang on, Hans, you need to unmute. Sorry, can you hear? Yes, me? that's fine. I listened to very much uh, to Alison and also to uh, to Craig and what you had said and the video. And uh, my adrenaline began to flow much faster because it brought back so violently the um, obstacles that were in our way as uh, United Nations civil servants to portray um, a political reality, a, a humanitarian reality. And it was blocked and often successfully blocked because um, there was intimidation, there was pressure, there was lobby against truth. Yes, there is the power of truth, but there's also the power of false truth. For count, uh, alternate facts, as Mr. Trump used to refer to. Uh, we had to battle against these alternate facts. And uh, if I may be permitted, I want to First of all, I want to preface what I'm, I'm, I'm going to, about to say with an, in, an expression of immense gratitude uh, to WikiLeaks for having brought the story out, the story also the Iraq story. But let me give you one example that hasn't come out yet, even today, uh, and it shows how brutal the battle was played in order to maintain 
the policies that two prominent members of the UN Security Council, uh, the UK, of course, and, and the US um, played and did everything to cover up. I traveled in Northern Iraq in, I can tell you even the date on the 29th of April, 1999. And I looked at work in the Kurdish areas and I suddenly got a message that there had been a terrible airstrike uh, north of Mosul that led to the <laughs> demise of six shepherds and 101 sheep. Okay, that's not why I'm telling you this story. I'm telling you this story because on the same day, the 29th of April, there was a press statement from the US command in Stuttgart, Germany, responsible for the area, for Iraq, saying that they had successfully disarmed and destroyed a, an air, an anti-aircraft facility in Iraq. Well, we didn't know that uh, six shepherds and 101 sheep uh, were dangerous anti-aircraft facilities, but that's how it was played. Now, the public saw that. The public never knew, heard about the sheep and, and the shepherds, a dramatic incident. And that is how the Iraq story evolved. And even today, there are a great number of undiscovered, terrible misuse of uh, military power, of political maneuvering. We know all that, you know it as well as I do. So I want to lean back and say, really, I mean it, uh, thank God, there was WikiLeaks. And I ask you, what did WikiLeaks do that normal mainstream media in the US and the UK didn't do anyway? They reported, they tried to report on uh, facts. They gave truth a chance, not always, but often. And therefore we have to do, I feel I have a, a moral responsibility to uh, speak out belatedly. I haven't been very involved until recently. In fact, until I met uh, John Shipton, the father, uh, in Berlin a few weeks ago, and I asked him, what you read in the press? Is this correct? And the answer was, no, it is much worse. And therefore, uh, I think anyone who has a, a basic understanding of what is happening here in the, in the world of geopolitical power must get involved. And I feel I came in late, but I feel very committed. Uh, and I also understand how incredibly global the Assange case has, has become. This morning in my little hometown, I don't know whether you can see when I hold this up. Can you see this? Yes. In my little hometown, 19,000 people, there was a, a statement about Assange. So it has become global, local, regional, global. And as, as it was said already, it is a tragedy that civil society uh, is ahead of government, is ahead of politics in trying to correct false impressions that are circulating around the globe. So uh, all of us, and I hope that in this time that we have, uh, we can talk a little bit about not what has happened, but what needs to happen in order to backstop, help Assange. And by helping Assange, we're helping ourselves. I see Assange in court representing all of us in court. His court case is our court case because at stake, at, at, at very much at stake, is the fact that if we lose that battle for truth, um, we are in trouble. Hans, thanks very much. Um, now to our viewers, um, just let me say that if you want to ask a question to our panel, please do use the Q&A function on Zoom or the comment function on Facebook or make a note on Twitter and we'll try and feed it through to them in the course of the of the discussion. Um, 
before we do that, uh, just just one question to you all as as former diplomats. Um, it's often sort of um, conveyed to you through uh, media reports that the idea that you should have a kind of transparency in global diplomacy is a kind of exotic and kind of uh, ridiculous, uh, ridiculous idea. But um, I just wonder whether perhaps it is as ridiculous as some people say, because if people cast their mind back, for instance, to the the period after the First World War, a war which, after all, many people thought was uh, at least partly caused by secret treaties and secret diplomacy, uh, there was a worldwide outcry for clear and transparent diplomacy. In fact, President Woodrow Wilson, the American president, made his famous 14 points speech, the first of which was that diplomacy should be always conducted frankly and in public view. Um, Alison, do you think we'd be better off if we got back to that kind of conception? I do, John, indeed. Thank you for the question. And I think all of us would agree that it's not so much the virtues of, of secrecy that are often talked about are not nearly as great as they are claimed. And what they, in fact, allow is a shield behind which people do things that they know others won't know about. Now, if there is a genuine reason why something has to, like international negotiations over something where your position is something you don't want to reveal to the other side uh, for a while until it's all agreed, that kind of thing, I suppose, is, is tactful and useful, and that happens in diplomacy all the time. But when it's used as a smokescreen behind which shameful events can be concealed, well, then it defeats its purpose. And in fact, it actually lowers the trust between governments upon which diplomacy depends. And diplomacy, after all, is the only thing that we have standing between us and the annihilation. And if we degrade diplomacy in the way it's being degraded at the moment, particularly in Western countries and, and notably in my own, with, with foreign services being shrunk and the power within the system of the foreign service being diminished by the day in favour of what's called national security, which covers a whole multitude of the sorts of sins I've just been talking about, then we are all going to be poorer off for it. And if there's ever a moment, it's now when we need diplomacy, that is the peaceful arts of international negotiation to be working instead of the aggressive ones. I mean, it's the Secretary General of the United Nations, Mr. Guterres, who said the other day that in the, at the heat, at the peak of the, of the COVID-19 crisis, we need to be putting all our resources into solving this health problem, not putting huge resources into killing each other. And if there were ever a more um, mm -hmm. glaring opposition between what people are saying in diplomacy and in government everywhere, what people are saying and what they're actually doing, that would highlight it. And that's the kind of reason why people like me uh, are supporting Julian and have been for many years because he actually told the truth. It was like the emperor and the clothes, you know, he said it and everyone said, oh, that's right. And it is right. Now, can I just add one small thing? We hope when we change governments that things may get better. Well, a succession of Australian leaders has vilified Julian and his cause in public, including the current prime minister who says that he must face the music, which is quite different from what they're doing, they have just done for this British Australian dual national so-called spy in Iraq, over whom great efforts were expended to get her released, which has just happened. The contrast between what Australia has done for her and Britain too, I understand, uh, and what they have not done for Julian, who isn't a spy and who hasn't 
killed anybody and isn't responsible for any crime at all, whatever she's accused of, is just glaring. Secondly, your splendid British judge who called him a narcissist and said he believes he's above the law. And thirdly, you might hope for something better from President-elect Biden. Well, alas, he said during the height of the WikiLeaks cri of the um, cable great crisis, he said Julian was a high-tech terrorist. Now, if you're a high-tech terrorist in the United States, you're a terrorist of any kind, that exposes you to the Patriot Act. And that is serious. Mm. And for them to assure us that no harm will come to Julian if he's extradited to the United States, we will all have his fate on our hands. Right. And uh, what's your view about, uh, about this? I mean, in a way, uh, when you uh, resigned your job, it was because the truth about the sanctions regime in Iraq was insufficiently publicly known, really. It was. I didn't hear that. It was partly because the effects of the sanctions on Iraqi society were, were insufficiently known. Well, yeah, look, there were a thousand UN people on the ground administering the oil for food program, a humanitarian program, 200 international and the rest local. There were American, British colleagues until um, the disaster of the air attack in uh, December of 1998, when the government asked my British and American colleagues to leave. We reported to New York the facts. We, there was no ideology here involved. And what happened? We started, when I entered that office, I was involved in writing the six monthly reports on the humanitarian condition in that country. You know what happened? Suddenly out of New York, we received colleagues who came to help us in quote, to write the reports. I said, I'm sorry, we are writing the reports. Demands by the French and others for Dennis Halliday, my predecessor in Iraq and myself to, uh, to come and brief the Security Council were consistently blocked by the British and American uh, governments. Truth hurts. They, they didn't want us to go there and give a picture which was so different. The State Department in September 99 published a, a report called Saddam Hussein's Iraq. We looked at that in Baghdad and started, first we started laughing, my colleagues and I, because it was so superficial. Then became, we became angry because we began to realize the implications such a report had on the uh, uh, public mind in, in particular the Western world. Well, that's how the game was played. Their report was more important than our uh, attempt to portray as honestly as we could the local conditions. And I must add one thing here, maybe that's of interest. The fragmentation on policy um, involving Iraq in the Security Council, unfortunately, was reflected also in the uh, lack of cohesion in the UN Secretariat. Secretary Kofi Annan had one group of people that sort of supported what we were mandated to do in Iraq. The other one, I must name names, and that is the Deputy Secretary General, Madame Frechette, represented another group of people. And the end result was a fragmented approach that affected first and foremost, the protection um, of uh, 23 million Iraqis. Now that's how the game was played. I was, they tried to make me write, or they write a report and then classify this as, as my report. Um, the other thing was there was no policy whatsoever um, that one could call an integrated approach in dealing with Iraq from a human rights perspective, from a security perspective, and from a humanitarian um, point of view, because two out of the five permanent members in the Security Council were not willing to give up what they perceived 
to be the correct approach in dealing with a dictator. I'm not defending Saddam Hussein. He was punished, not in the way I would have supported, but he was punished. Who was not punished were those who were in, in, in positions of, of power. They still, are, Mr. Bush and Tony Blair still are um, free. That cannot be the kind of United Nations that I want to see that uh, cooperates with um, governments that have gone astray. The point coming back to the, the purpose of our get together here is that the efforts of Assange and his team, he has colleagues who have tried as he has to make sure that the truth reaches people. They must be honored, they must be supported. And I wanted to say um, in the five minutes that you had assigned to us for a beginning statement, I wanted to make what I'm sure most of the people who hear what I now say will consider ludicrous. But I say in the spirit of civil society is much further ahead in defending Assange than governments, we all have voices. The Queen of England also has a voice. Well, shouldn't she speak out? Is that preposterous to say that? I don't think so. She has a voice, we have a voice. The judges of the Supreme Court of the UK have voices. What have they said? They have left it to lower courts and one feels fairly, not hopeless. I'm hopeful that in the end it, it comes out the way justice should work, but helpless very often because one thing is, is, is a reality, which is civil society is not well organized. We have to become much more united in our efforts to uh, give direction to uh, government policies, whether it's in Germany or whether it's in the UK or anywhere else. Mm. And, exactly. and therefore- Exactly, and, and that's actually a point I want to put to, to, to Craig for a moment, really, because both on the question of campaigning for the reasons that Hans has, uh, has just enumerated, but, but more generally about the, the question of secrecy or not in diplomacy, what's really at stake here is uh, whether or not ordinary people are going to be allowed to butt into the conversation. I mean, you know, um, Hans's description of the debates inside the UN, everybody knows that those take place right across the political spectrum in all walks of uh, life and in every political institution. But without transparency, the public are excluded from those discussions. It, isn't, isn't that what's at stake here, Craig? I'm, I think that's very true, but the ability of ordinary people, ordinary voters in democracies to make informed decisions and choices about the policies being carried out by the government is severely limited by the, the limiting of the information available to them. And uh, plainly, that's the object of the confidentiality that you see uh, in uh, the majority of cases in these telegrams. There are, I mean, having been a diplomat, there, there are cases where, uh, and I'm, I'm sure my colleagues would agree, where um, there, there, there are genu there's a genuine need for secrecy on, on occasions. For example, when you are engaged in a negotiation, particularly uh, a conflict resolution uh, negotiation, you may be uh, putting possible measures to, to, to one side which are not yet ready to put to the other side. Or, or, um, and I was engaged, for example, in the Sierra Leone uh, treaty, peace treaty negotiations. Mm. And, and there were times there where you were having discussions with people who it would actually be very dangerous if, if others found out they were involved in the discussions and what you were discussing. Uh, 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 and you did need to be able uh, to maintain uh, confidentiality during the, the process of the talks and and make sure that your reports back to back to headquarters weren't leaked. But I would say that where there is the need for that kind of confidentiality, where there's a genuine need, it is almost always a time limited need. Uh, you know, it's to do with the operational requirements of the time. 
Whereas that, of course, isn't the way that these secrets are, are treated. Normally, um, uh, even for bog standard boring uh, confidential material, it's 20 or 30 years before they, um, they let it out. It used to be 30 years almost always. They've slightly become more flexible lately, but it, it's a long, long period. And other secrets are kept indefinitely, uh, you know, almost never to be to be released. And this obsession with secrecy, I think, is um, is extremely unhelpful, unhealthy, and is is fundamentally uh, undemocratic. Um, listening to um, Hans, I was reminded of the of our own, you know, of the British diplomatic telegrams I was seeing at the time of which he speaks prior to the invasion of Iraq. Um, and uh, there were very interesting um, telegrams sent by Jeremy Greenstock, our ambassador in New York, uh, in which he was giving very honest and open assessments of our level of support in the Security Council, um, in which he was saying that basically, if you go for a vote in the Security Council, not only will the invasion of Iraq be vetoed, you actually won't even get a majority of the council. The majority of Security Council members will vote against you. It's a, it won't just be a question of a veto. And um, I remember Jeremy got in trouble for that. He, he was told off <laughs> for, for, for saying that because the, the, um, uh, the official justification was, well, in the end, they came up with justification that we... We didn't need a second resolution because another resolution passed 10 years earlier was sufficient justification. But the, the political justification was we were avoiding an unreasonable veto. Uh, whereas, in fact, Jeremy had made perfectly plain um, that we would lose. We would actually lose the vote itself. We, we, we'd be in a minority at the Security Council. And as I say, I... I happen to know he got he got told off for having put that in writing, because there's some secrets that aren't even allowed to be in a secret cable, um, and um, and and the other side of that is I recall at that time Baroness Amos was sent on a tour of African members of the Security Council, including I think Gabon was on the Security Council at that time, and I recall she went to Gabon, which no British minister had been to more or less ever, I think. And, and the, a lot of these places were very surprised to have a British minister suddenly turn up and suddenly start offering them aid if they were to vote for the invasion of Iraq. Um, and um, I was previously the deputy head of the African Department of the Foreign Office, and I knew all these people, and I knew all our ambassadors. And all our ambassadors, I think we have four African countries who visited, all our ambassadors wrote back telegrams saying, how great her visit was, how everything went splendidly, and how her hosts were entirely convinced, and they were all going to vote for us on the Security Council. Um, and I actually phoned up one of them, who was a friend of mine, and said, to him, well, that, that's not true. What, what? He said, no, but, you know, Baroness Amos was in the country. I couldn't write the truth. And so I couldn't write back a telegram saying, this is a waste of time. She's a useless minister. They laughed at her. I, I, I can't write that. Um, so you have to read between the lines of diplomatic cables and appreciate what is behind them as well. Okay. Um, well, look, there are some questions coming in, some of them which uh, you may or may not feel uh, qualified to, to comment on. Um, one of which is, uh, why hasn't the ACLU in the United States uh, taken on uh, taken on the case. Perhaps that's beyond our, our remit today, but I, I put it out there uh, for you. Um, and there's one uh, here which also says, uh, is there any real possibility that Trump would pardon Julian? So, um, I mean, I guess in a way, the answer, the answer to that question is, is vital, but um, even if you think not, then it doesn't undermine the value of asking because uh, he certainly should and it raises the profile of the campaign. So um, I, I'm going to ask you with, with all your diplomatic experience to, to double dress uh, uh, President Trump. So good luck uh, with, uh, with that. But uh, I don't want anybody to stop asking him no matter what your answer is. So first of all, Alison, what, what do you reckon?
Just need just need to uh, unmute, Alison. Okay, there we go. Yeah. I, I was just going to say, I think it would be Trump's finest hour if he did. Don't forget, don't forget <laughs> that Bill, that uh, President Obama, his predecessor, pardoned uh, Chelsea Manning, and for Trump to follow that example uh, would be splendid. And I must say, uh, it would offset his current propensity to do something worse in Iran, which I'm really worried about between now and January, something really serious could happen if he wants to sort of go out with the mother of all explosions. Um, the way things are moving, if he wants to ingratiate the Israelis, that's exactly what he's going to do. So if somebody gets in his ear and says, hey, that you need something to offset your image and, and pardoning Julian would be great. As, as you know, there was an offer reportedly earlier on from the Trump administration to Julian to say, if he would accept certain conditions, uh, they would give him a plea bargain. And Julian, to his credit, refused that. May I just add to that too, that let's not forget what it was that, I mean, I don't want to see Julian in front of any court in the United States, particularly not in West Virginia, but let's not forget that it was um, Daniel Ellsberg who got off for the Pentagon Papers, not because he didn't do it. He did do it. He admitted he did it. He got off because they bugged his uh, phone and they uh, invigilated his psychiatrist's office. And this is exactly what the CIA, we all know, has done and it was brought up in the trial recently in London. We know that the CIA has done this to Julian via the Spanish security company, which uh, uh, bugged his rooms in the embassy of Ecuador, sent all of that information back to the CIA, and that in the United States should make it illegal. I would hope that a British court, if it went to the Supreme Court, would see it in the same way. Uh, Craig, uh, what are you thinking about this? I mean, Trump seems to be, um, first of all, concerned whether or not he can pardon himself. But if he gets around to considering Julian, what do you think his answer would be? Um, it, it's very hard to say. <laughs> it really is very, very hard to predict Trump. I've, I've often held the view that his actions with regard to Julian are really um, not driven by him, but but by his security services, and that given that he he had such major, well, given his own security services spent most of his presidency trying to get rid of him, um, he he had such major problems with them that there was a limit to the number of uh, issues on which he was prepared to take them on. That that, that might be a hopeful way of um of of, of looking at it, um, but. I don't, I don't know. Uh, he, he's, he's an extremely unpredictable person. Um, Cats, we're, we're, we're not, we're not going to hold you to this or play the video later. But what, yeah, what no, no. I, 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 if you give me a, a, a chance, um, I wish nothing more than freedom for Assange. But the word pardon, pardon for having done the right thing, that disturbs me greatly. I cannot speak on behalf of Assange, but I can tell you one thing, and I, I will not say this lightly. If I were in a difficult situation and somebody would offer me pardon, uh, uh, I accept then that I did something wrong. I've done nothing wrong, uh, and therefore I don't accept a pardon. It's a disgusting word in, 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 in this kind of situation. He should be let out. He should, the British government should take up with the Swiss government the idea of a uh, humanitarian visa that was discussed before that didn't work out, uh, but it can be, uh, and I think this is one of the items that I would recommend to the UN Secretary General that he 
he supports the idea, that he speaks out, he hasn't spoken out on behalf of Assange in any form and sense. He has to start doing that. And uh, the, the word pardon, I'm afraid, is a terrible word in this context. You pardon somebody who has done something wrong. Assange has done nothing wrong. And then he, for purely um, pragmatic reasons, that may be life-saving, yes, it's, um, he should accept a pardon from a, a person who belongs into a mental asylum? No. Let's see yeah. what, let's see what Mr. Biden has in mind. Uh, maybe there is an easier way to handle this than to offer a pardon. Okay, Hans, thanks uh, very much. Now, we're just coming up to the hour and I don't want to um, try your patience or the, or the audiences. So I just want to get in, um, one last question, which is about the kind of contemporary re relevance of, of Cablegate and the issues that it raised. Um, I said in the introduction that in just in the last week, it's emerged that British troops have been sent to guard Saudi Arabian oil fields without either the public knowing or indeed without Parliament being asked. Um, Craig, um, if the prosecution of Assange goes ahead, if the extradition goes ahead and the prosecution goes ahead, then um, the world will be a worse place because that kind of act will be that much easier to commit uh, by governments behind the back of their electorates, will it not? I think that's right. Um, I mean, I think one thing which is um, slightly worrying is that there has been um, a slowdown, uh, you know, following... Uh, Cablegate and the other Bradley Manning revelations, and then following uh, Edward Snowden, um, we're, we're we're all waiting, you know, for the next uh, raft of of releases. I think um, uh, some of what we've seen, the Panama Papers, for example, is rather disappointing because it wasn't put straight to the web; it was entirely mediated through journalists, and and and, uh, and as a result, we were treated to lots of revelations about somebody who used to be a chef who worked for somebody who knew President Putin, uh, and, but, but very little else. Uh, you know, the Panama Papers remarkably revealed nothing whatsoever about any senior American or British people. Um, uh, and that, I fear, was a, was a result of over-mediation. We, 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 I'm, I'm very much hoping and praying. WikiLeaks is, of course, dependent on what people drop off to it. Uh, and I am very much hoping and praying that the next big revelation is around the corner. But it does feel at the moment a little bit like that dramatic opening up of secrets, that clearing of space, that, that brave new world of citizen knowledge um, appears to be put rather, rather back on ice. Uh, and of course, that would be made much worse um, if Julian is... It, is punished for for reporting the truth, um, because the we shouldn't forget that the Americans are claiming universal jurisdiction uh, in their extradition request. They're saying that any journalist who, who publishes any secrets about the American state anywhere in the world uh, can be taken to the United States and tried for espionage. Um, and and the, the chilling effect on that uh, could be pretty, pretty awful. Uh, and I find the, um, the insouciance of, of, of the media um, about it really very, very difficult to understand. Uh, it, it, it seems to me that we are entering a darker period, or we have entered a darker period. And I, I think that Julian's um, prosecution is emblematic of that, uh, which is why it's so absolutely essential that, that everyone uh, mobilizes to resist it. Okay, Hans, uh, I, I know that, that you and Dennis Halliday are uh, engaged in a, in a project to uh, encourage the UN to take this case more, more seriously. What would you like to see happen? With regard to um, the assault? The UN. Sorry? To the UN's involvement with the case. Well, uh, I, I, I mean, we have evidence from UN uh, specialists, uh, the 
rapporteur on torture, for example, the working group on arbitrary detention, they have all spoken out, but in the wider scheme of things, they are underlings. Now the leaders, um, Secretary General himself, the High Commissioner for Human Rights in Geneva, Madame Bachelet, they should now come forward and speak out. And what Mrs. Bachelet has said about the case um, is uh, quite frankly unacceptable. She was saying in 2019, since then silence, um, the UN has to measure the effectiveness of its voice. And then she continued and said, it is following the case closely. A weak statement and since then silence. So the leaders in the UN, the political leaders have to come forward now and agree that they should make an honest attempt with the British government and the US government to close this case in favor of the release of Assange. That's my, 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 my hope for the, the weeks and months ahead as we enter now in this crucial uh, period uh, in, in the courts in London, uh, there should be an attempt to influence that process. Alison, what would you like to see happen next in terms of the campaign? Can't no, it's, it's, still, it's still muted. Okay. okay, now you're okay. I'd like to see the Australian government take responsibility, which it hasn't done throughout this whole episode. Stand up and say, we are not satisfied with what British justice has done. We are not satisfied with the prospect of what American justice is going to do. And this is our citizen. They might add whether we like him or not, but that would be the implication. And put the same effort into getting him out of Belfast and back to Australia, if that's where he wants to go, that they have put into a whole succession of cases in recent times, including people who were drug traffickers and pedophiles and all kinds of stuff, and, and, and people accused of espionage, as I've said before. I would like to see Australia for once stand up to its American British allies and say, look, we claim that we share values with you. All right, one of those values is the rule of law. And we don't see the rule of law being properly applied in this case. We are not satisfied with it. And we want Julian released sooner rather than later. Now we have had a parliamentary friendship group whose representative went to London last November at the beginning of the trials and, and Andrew Wilkie and made those points, but that was a very that was not the government as a whole. It was not the, the, the ruling party saying that. But that's what I would like to see happen. And if it doesn't, Australian politicians will have it on their conscience. Alison, uh, thank you very much. Um, and thank you very much for getting so early to join us. Um, hands on Spunnik. Very good to see you. Very good to see you campaigning on this issue. Um, proud once again to be on the same side of a campaigning issue with you. And Craig Murray, thank you for the work that you've done all the way through this campaign and for your contribution to the discussion uh, today. I hope to see you all on platforms again in the future uh, very shortly. To the rest of you, um, thanks very much for, for watching. Um, this is the civil liberties case of the 21st century. Uh, please be a part of making sure that freedom of press and freedom of speech prevail in this case. The next decisive date will be when uh, the judge in the magistrate's court it's actually completely beyond me why a civil liberties case of global significance is being heard in the magistrate's court, which is usually where you go when you've committed a motoring offence in Britain. But nevertheless, that judge will be giving her judgment on the 4th of January. It's very likely that whether or not uh, the extradition hearing uh, uh, concludes that Julian should be extradited or that he should not, there will be, a, be an appeal either by um, our defence team or by the Americans' prosecution team. So the case will in all likelihood go to a higher court in the, pro, in the course of 2021. 
That's just to give you an idea of what the time scale is. So please make sure that whatever you can do, you do do. There is no act which is too small to help. If you can share this video on Facebook and Twitter, please do so. If you can donate some money, we definitely need it. If you can participate in the protests yourself, come down to the court on the morning of the 4th of January, please do do that. There have been in recent weeks some uh, very important developments in the trade union movement with the National Union of Journalists issuing a call to all trade unionists to support the Assange case. And that's been uh, supported by Unite, one of the biggest unions in the country, by the big teachers union, the NEU, and by the train drivers union, ASLEF. We have the support of very many parliamentarians and the press and the NGOs have in recent months been much more supportive than they have been in the early part of the campaign. So we feel that the tide is turning and that your efforts will be uh, rewarded by pulling people around you who can see that freedom of speech and freedom of the press should not be allowed to die in the Julian Assange case. So do get in contact with the DEA campaign on our website, our Twitter and our Facebook, and help us make sure that in the new year, Julian Assange walks free. Thanks very much for watching and look out for future broadcasts.